Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Redford, and this is the follow-up. Coming up on tonight's show, what is AI, artificial intelligence, and why are so many people talking about it? Is this something to fear or embrace? Depends on who you talk to, but one thing is clear, AI is here to stay, and it's already impacting most everything we do, whether you know it or not. Tonight, we have three educators who know a thing or two about AI and what you need to know. But first, we have viewer reaction from last week's show when we discussed the 2024 presidential race and concerns by many that the two main presidential rivals, President Biden and former President Trump, may be too old for the White House. And in recent days, President Biden's mental acuity has been put into question. This viewer had an opinion on the age issue when she dialed into our follow up hotline. I'm calling from Grand Blank, Michigan, about the current uh, presidential election. I'm soon to be 89 years old. Age is somewhat a factor, but not the primary factor with me because, number one, we are all, for the most part, living longer. Age can be an affirmative factor because you have education, background, and experience going for you. And I think that's very important whether it's President of the United States or CEO of an organization. Um, the other thing that I think why I'm very comfortable with Biden, I think he has a good brain trust around him. Well, I appreciate the feedback. Something to think about there. And we'd like to hear from more of you to help drive the conversation here on the show. You can do that in a variety of ways. Via social media on Facebook, you can email us. You can post a comment on YouTube. You can dial into our follow-up hotline, as that viewer just did. And if you'd like to watch any of our past shows this season, just log on to deltapublicmedia.org. Now for tonight's show, we've got two folks in studio and one dialing in remotely. Uh, Peter Berry, philosophy professor from Saginaw Valley State University. Nick Gaspar, Director of Online and Digital Education, University of Michigan, Flint. Hello. And dialing in remotely, your colleague, uh, Dr. Douglas Zeitko, Associate Professor of Innovative Technology at the University of Michigan, Flint. It's going to be a great discussion. So I did not ask this question to chat GPT, although I could have. <laughs> uh, but I did Google this question. Uh, what is the simplest defi definition of artificial intelligence? And kind of here's what we uh, came up with. It's the science of making machines that can think like humans. It can do things that are considered smart. AI technology can process large amounts of data in ways unlike humans. The goal for AI is to be able to do things such as recognize patterns, make decisions, and judge like humans. Okay, so what do you make of that definition? Would you describe it differently, Peter? I'll start with you. If you're trying to define it for somebody who doesn't have a clue what it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, so much rides on the word artificial, right? Yeah. Um, and so if we substitute non-human for the word artificial, which is I think what we're typically getting at, mm -hmm. um, then whatever you think is involved <coughs> in intelligence quite normally, you're sort of there. It's just a question of whether something like non-human beings and maybe non-animal life has it. Um, now, the question, what is intelligence in itself, is a pretty good philosophical question. Um, and I don't know that, our, that typically what we're talking about, say, when we're talking about chat GPT or large learning models, is necessarily approximating all of what we would call intelligence. But man, it's awfully good at a lot of what we would normally yep. pick up on as intelligent or intelligence behavior. Um, right. So at the very least, the reason these things are so interesting for so many of us is because whether you think an AI model really is intelligent in the way that a human being is, it's at least close enough to the real thing that it should be perking up our philosophical antenna. Yeah, yeah and if I could add to that. Um, so what this is, uh, the, so what you're seeing in the news, especially with ChatGPT, is a subset of AI called generative AI. Um, and what that means is, as, a, as an AI, it's, it's a model that sits on its own and doesn't really do anything until a human interacts with it. So a human then enters some sort of a prompt for it to, to perform some action or to generate something, uh, and then it creates some sort of content that is typically unique every time you ask for it. Okay. 
Well, all three of our educators in, in different places. I mean, Peter, your philosophy, I know Nick and, and Douglas are kind of in digital education, innovative technology. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit how it's just sort of rocked your world and how you're sort of changing things up, how it impacts teachers, how it impacts students? If, if I can yep. yeah. uh, one of the reasons that this has been so challenging for a lot of us who are sort of outside your world and don't have that sort of specialization and skill set is that it sure, s I mean, and ChatGPT is maybe one of the <coughs> biggest issues for a lot of my colleagues. Um, if you ask, I think a lot of them would sort of equate AI and ChatGPT, even given the point about generative intelligence there. Um, but it, I don't want to say it popped up out of nowhere, nope. but it jumped up on us real quickly in education, right? The, pla um, the, the, the relevant platforms became easily accessible and very cheap. I mean, yeah. if you've got a computer, you can get ChatGPT to work for you. Um, at this point, there's not too much, by the way, of a queue to wait in, in line anymore. Um, and it is so fast, and it is so good at what it does. And the typical student, for example, could use it with so little instruction, and the results were at least good, if not, if, if not perfect, certainly good enough that a lot of students were sort of willing to use it in ways that had not necessarily been tested or vetted and posed some real questions about what constitutes cheating, what constitutes dishonesty, what's a violation of academic integrity. Does ChatGPT become something like something like Microsoft Word, which can do a certain amount of work for students and improve work, or is it substituting um, is it no longer a student's own original contribution? And this is maybe worth getting into and maybe talking about the ways that we can use ChatGPT in the classroom that are more to, sort of constructive and helpful. Um, but at least the initial kind of slap bang reaction was students are writing papers with ChatGPT and I cannot tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um, a couple summers ago, a colleague of mine who teaches engineering ethics um, emailed everyone in the philosophy department a response to a prompt. Right. And it was a very standard philosophy 101 type question. The response was not perfect. It was kind of boilerplate. But it was at least a B answer, if not an yep. A answer. And if you're a student and for very minimal cost, that's the kind of work product that you can regularly get, boy, there's an obvious incentive to, to, to use it, yeah. um, and maybe in possibly nefarious ways. So at least the first wave for a lot of us was, dear God, what do I do in response to right. this kind of right. thing? And <clears throat> so uh, to, to build off that, uh, so I consider myself an AI optimist in this area. Um, and this is going to be revolutionary for edu education. Right, it came on the scene quickly, uh, but it's going to accelerate te teaching and curriculum development. It's going to accelerate learning. It'll accelerate research. And the reason, as you brought up, how like the way it came on so fast is that so those of us that are alive today have experienced many technological revolutions like semiconductor, um, the internet, and mobile technology. And now what has happened is some of those things have all come together. Um, and, and with mobile, if you have a phone in your pocket, you now have access to an artificial intelligence assistant right in your pocket. And it's ubiquitous now. Sure. So I'm going to bring Douglas into the conversation because the kind of research he's doing is, is very uh, groundbreaking and, and fascinating. And I think the viewers would find this um, very interesting. So, so Douglas, some of the work you've been doing lately is around sort of deep fake pornography, social dynamics around that. Uh, for example, sort of using your words, and we've sort of talked reports of high school boys making AI-generated nude images of their female classmates, or Taylor Swift and all the uh, deep fake uh, pornography. So, talk to us about that work and how deep you're getting into that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of attention is being paid, and rightfully so, to the implications of generative AI in the classroom, uh, such as generating an entire assignments that the student had no hand in creating. But, the, but another use that we're starting to see emerge in the public sphere is AI-generated imagery, including videos or static images or even audio that you would think are real. There are real images taken by that person um, or videos that were that were really shot by that person. And one of the more damaging use cases that we're now seeing is AI generated pornography. Uh, and there are a lot of apps now proliferating the internet. Some of them are called nudify apps that allow a user to take images from social media. So, so some of the use cases that we're seeing so far, unfortunately, are uh, boys in high school or in college going on social media, going on the Instagram accounts of some of their female classmates, 
saving those images, uploading them to one of these Nudify apps, and it generates a nude looking image of that person that would look totally indistinguishable from a real nude image, and then sharing those either around school or online. And the, one of the biggest concerns here is how do you convince people who see these images that they're not actually real? Because sometimes images that find their way on the internet stay on the internet. And uh, for better or worse, we've now seen this affect some really big name celebrities like Taylor Swift that have uh, drawn more attention to this issue and that hopefully will uh, lead to some positive change, not only in legislation, but in the design of social media platforms and other online technologies that we see our students using. Well, and just recently with these political ads, right? I think President Biden's voice, well, altered his voice and AI was showing up on political ads and now they're trying to put a stop to it, try to regulate it, but it's not easy, right? And I think, Nick, you and I talked beforehand sort of the societal impacts yeah. of this as it relates to sort of mental health. Yep. We're, we're kind of, that's what he's touched on a little yeah. bit, right? I mean, yeah, and to Doug's point, um, this it's very alarming what's possible now and, and you need no skill to do it as long as you have access to the right tools. Um, and in the case of what happened on Twitter with Taylor Swift, you know, she has a legal team to back her up. She has a fan base to back her up. And I, get, I worry about just the random woman on the street that doesn't have those resources. And how does that woman get support to deal with this issue? So I really hope that legislation comes through uh, and, and those of us working on these problems can figure out solutions. But also on the mental health side of the house, especially since um, the pandemic lockdowns, we have this ongoing loneliness crisis. Mm. And so we are seeing more and more AI-based mental health apps emerging. And in one sense, hey, this is a nice positive in that if you have no money or low, or low cost uh, app access, you theoretically could talk to a mental health professional, we hope, is trained correctly. Um, or on the other hand, is this just going to exacerbate the loneliness where people can just kind of uh, sit alone in their homes and, and just interact with these types of tools and never actually go out and make those human connections that we, that we need to be doing in society? So regulations and monitoring it, I mean, Congress, <laughs> it's a free-for-all. I mean, they've been trying to sort of rein in the social media giants for a long time. Just a couple of weeks ago, they were kind of were grilling this panel because of the information that was getting out there and talking about the harm it's doing to their kids, and they sort of apologized, but yep. they didn't come to any conclusions. So how do, you, how do you rein that in? And now Congress is going to try to rein in AI. My biggest worry about this is, I mean, I guess there's two worries about it, is that, first of all, if you could identify a less qualified group of people than your typical set of congressmen <laughs> who do not have technical, uh, they just don't have the background and the skill set to kind of navigate this, but also lots of incentives to kind of like not solve the problem. Right. If they even come up with a solution, it's going to take so long. Um, and we were talking about this before, that the technology is developing so quickly and by, me by leaps and bounds that by the time they come up to something that looks like a solution, that solution is going to be three years in our in our rear view mirror and there will be a whole other set of problems if we're if we're waiting for legislators to solve this problem um i, I think we're we're hoping for a, a, a i think we're hoping i think we're hoping for a savior that's never going to show up right so douglas let me ask you because you've been working in the space you've been talking about probably long before sort of ai started taking off so how has your work changed and how has that your work expanded i know you got a grant to do some of this work so talk about that yeah, well, we can we can continue talking about ways in which we could address or mitigate some of the adverse use cases of, of generative AI. So we talked a little bit about legislation and how it might be forever for that legislation to catch up to the current technical capabilities. One of the other popular technical approaches to this is detection of generative AI. So different types of artificial intelligence whose job is to detect when content that it finds online or that is submitted to it is in fact created by a human or by another artificial intelligence. And one of the problems there is those um, deep fake or generative AI detection uh, tools, they're not foolproof. And so we're starting to see issues in the classroom of professors erroneously accusing students of um, using generative AI tools to do their do their assignments, which is not true, or, or in the case of uh, deep fakes, um, some actually legitimate online content being mislabeled as generated or altered by AI. 
So one definition we didn't get into is sort of the chat GPT. I sort of just threw that out, but there may be some viewers <coughs> out there wondering, what is chat GPT? How do I access, how do I use it? What are the pros and cons? Is that what the students are using? Or is there another form of chat GPT? You want to uh, define I, that I a little? I think it's chat GPT, but I'm happy there, to defer to my colleagues. Sure, there are several forms. So chat GPT is the most popular. It's the one yeah. that everybody seems to know in the media. Uh, Google has its own. It was once mm. called BARD. It's now called Gemini. And then Microsoft has been making massive investments, and in, including a partnership with OpenAI. Um, and their, their tool is called Copilot. OK. So tell us again from, from your uh, places of higher learning, how they're sort of managing it from the top on down, or do you are just sort of on your own on an island as a professor, kind of creating your own rules? Yes and no. Um, there are certainly university, re so I'll, if I can yeah. speak about SVSU, yes. there are certainly <coughs> resources, um, and we have people dedicated to um, providing faculty with assistance and resources and education. Um, and sometimes, and I hope we come back to this because I'm really worried we're sounding like the AI pessimists um, when there's so much room for optimism here. And I don't want to <coughs> lose sight of that for all its problems, the kind of solutions that a, um, artificial intelligence can provide as well. But part of it is going to require education. Yep. You know, some of us, especially in the humanities, just aren't particularly tech savvy, and we're going to have to get up to speed. That's going to require someone getting us up to speed, but also providing not just you know defensive capabilities. Um, there's been um, a mechanism for student plagiarism that a lot of us got very comfortable with called Turnitin.com. Mm -hmm. That's good at what it does. This is a different problem. So we we don't just want to have. Um, sort of plagiarism detectors. We also want to have sort of proactive resources, right? How might instructors <coughs> use ChatGPT, Chat GPT, for example, in the classroom um, that enhance student learning, um, that maybe not only kind of get around those opportunities to plagiarize and cheat, but actually can enhance student experiences, provide them with resources and capabilities that they didn't have. Um, let's not pretend it's all a problem. Let's Let's be, this is a tool like anything else, and there might be ways of using it properly. The more we can educate faculty and students to use these things properly, um, then maybe at least as far as academia yeah. goes, we can, we can avoid <coughs> some of those problems by proxy. Similar uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, especially for the Flint campus that I can speak to directly, it's really about exploring the technology, um, trying to avoid banning it if possible <coughs> um, yeah. in certain areas. Because I think about like the internet when that was coming around. These days, it'd be impossible to ban it, right? It's, there's no way you could do it. So as, we, um, as this advances, there's a similar argument you could be made. Like, we don't want to go down that road. We want people to understand it, um, explore it, experiment with it, um, figure out what it can do, what it's good at, what it's not good at, and then um, potentially integrate it. So integrating their teaching into their learning. Um, so that way, we can get to that acceleration point that I spoke to earlier. So beyond the campuses that you guys are on, like Nick at U of M Flint and Doug, you too, are, are you coaching, educating other educators off of your campus? And like the research you're doing, Doug, is that going to expand? I know it's expanding beyond U of M Flint. Nick, same with you. You're coaching yep. other school yep. districts, right? right? So Doug, do you want to take that? Well, yeah, let me just uh, just tag on to, to Nick's point. I think at University of Michigan Flint, we've just been so proactive uh, about educating our faculty and our students about the implications of generative AI. And, and to be honest, Nick has been extremely instrumental in that. Um, I, I joined the University of Michigan Flint last semester, and within my first week, I was in a seminar hosted by Nick, uh, teaching faculty from all different disciplines what this technology really is, um, how it really works. And, and I thought he gave just the best arguments uh, to convince faculty not to outright ban it in the classroom. And one of the things that, that I tell my students who are in information technology and in computer science is that generative AI tools and, and AI tools more broadly are going to be transforming the nature of work yep. once they finish their degrees and go into the workforce. And to discourage students from familiarizing themselves with these tools is putting them at a disadvantage when they actually graduate and get a job because their contemporaries, their peers, their competition for the top paying jobs, they're going to be using these tools because they're going to be encouraged for use in the workforce. And Nick, I know yeah. you, you talked about educating other folks in other school districts, yep. one particular up north. I thought yep. that was sort of interesting. Yeah, <clears throat> so I've been going around, um, right, so I've been educating K-12 districts, uh, other colleges and universities. Uh, I was I was I came uh, I was invited to talk to the Leland School District 
Um, and I went through my education. There's a whole 90 minute piece that I do. Um, and I had a teacher raise her hand and say, just to tell the group, I have sixth graders that are now submitting AI generated work to her. Mm -hmm. And that was my own point of reflection to, to think about, wow, so young people are embracing this younger and younger ages. And I think about myself being that age during the time of the internet and how it was in my formative years, I know it inside and out. These young people will have the same experience where they're gonna know these tools inside and out if they've grown up with them. And it's gonna vastly change the name of education, like the name of the game when it comes to education uh, in the not too distant future. And uh, Nick, I'll just follow up with yeah. that because you've been in sort of the IT world a, lo a long time. Have you ever seen anything quite like this? No, I mean, even I think back to the internet, nothing has advanced this fast. The, the things it could do six months ago pale in comparison to the things it can do today. Like for example, it has vision now, and you can talk to it with your voice. Right. Now, Peter, you and I touched on, I think, chat GPT and, and a little bit of AI maybe a year ago. Yeah. What's changed since then in, in your mind and how you're sort of, it's filtering down to your students and, and what you do day to day? Um, I mean, it's clearly getting better at what it does. Yeah. Um, whether students kind of have that sort of institutional knowledge about how to use that better tool is still kind of an open question. Um, but we've kind of gotten past the initial freak out, we're all going to lose our job stage. Right. And now people are having intelligent conversations about how to use the thing as a resource. So in some ways, the most interesting change, um, even though, again, leaps in magnitudes yep. in a very short period of time, but the, inter the interesting changes aren't almost so much what artificial intelligence is doing, and say ChatGPT in particular is now capable of, and what it's doing better, it's what we're able to do better um, in response, and how to say integrate it into a learning cur curriculum and sort of other areas of life as well. And again, I really want to emphasize, there's, it, I hope this doesn't all sound um, l like dark days for the audience, because there are incredible opportunities yeah, mm -hmm. here, right? When you think of students who maybe need help with writing, if you know how to, and this will be where yep. your office is going to be really, really helpful. If students understand how to ask something like a chat GPT the right questions for advice about writing a clearer paper, yep. or perhaps um, what are some possible objections to this thesis, and then they can think critically about how to respond. There's opportunities to use this, again, very low cost and very efficient mechanism to get students to do the kinds of things that we really do want them to do. Outside of education, there's tremendous opportunities. Um, and I know some people worry about jobs and labor, and we can talk about that too. But imagine I just need help with like a very boilerplate kind of legal document, right? Um, instead of contracting with a very expensive lawyer who's maybe not available in the time I need, if I could construct a legal document using artificial intelligence that checks all the bells and you know, that checks all the boxes, um, that's a very <coughs> efficient use of time and resources. Right. If I need assistance with like telehealth. Um, I'm in pretty good health. If I'm on some medication and there's a fairly stock um, kind of question and answer period that a doctor or nurse practitioner would, would, would ask me, um, but you can have artificial intelligence go through that exact same thing, and that saves everybody time and resources. That too could be incredibly valuable here. So again, AI, and I don't need to tell these guys this, but AI is a tool, like any tool, it can right. be misused and abused, but it can also be used for incredibly powerful positive uses as right. well, some of which we haven't really even imagined yet. So again, I don't want this to be all dark days. Yeah. I, think there, I, I really am an AI <laughs> optimist rather than a pessimist right. too. Right. So. Uh, and to build on that, so when we talk about student use of this technology, you really touched on two of the main points. Is uh, Number one would be writing assistance um, and tutoring is the second point. And so I try to get in front of these experts at the university on all three campuses. Um, and anybody else that, you know, if any of your viewers are in this, in this industry or, or work on tutoring issues or writing issues, uh, it's nothing for a student to go to ChatGPT or any other tool and say, I need help with APA formatting on this paper. Mm. And it will not only analyze the paper, but it will give them feedback on every step of the way, probably in under 10 seconds. And it will do the same thing in tutoring. And remember that with an AI tutor, the student never has to worry about how they're going to look asking a question. Mm. right? right. The, the AI will never judge them, or at least it shouldn't, right? Uh, and uh, it will always be there 24-7, where a tutor is only going to be there maybe during business hours. Yeah. So, so Doug, in the work you're doing, what's the next step in the research, and has the AI generative tools been able to kind of push your research up even faster to get where you want to get? Well, 
uh, generative AI is certainly complicated, uh, my research. Uh, so we're looking more into the positive implications of generative AI uh, in social computing, in social media, and in online dating in, in particular. Uh, for example, um, groups that have historically been at risk of sexual harm or harassment online, like women or members of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, they can really benefit from generative AI tools because it can help them craft an online persona that maintains their privacy and uh, protects their real identity uh, in case they're interacting with somebody online that they don't want to meet in person or don't want to be at risk of uh, through further interaction. And so I think there's a lot of positive use cases that, that are in need of further exploration. Okay, we've got a, a couple minutes left. Uh, at the beginning of the show, I talked about, is AI something we should embrace or should we fear, you know? <laughs> so. so we talked about this about a year ago, Mike. I mean, there's really two options here. You can either run from it or you can throw your arms around it. To your point before, running from it doesn't make any sense. Sure. It's not going anywhere. It's going to get better and faster and more available. So if you can't run from it, if that would be the worst of these alter two alternatives, then you really need to figure out a way to wrap your arms sure. around it, how to use this technology safely, proactively, and in positive ways. Um, so I hope those are the efforts going yep. forward. And I can tell you at the Flint campus of the University of Michigan, we definitely want to educate our community in this space. So. Uh, I have a prompt literacy course. I've made it free for anybody, whether you're with the university or not. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you can go to UMFLIN.edu uh, to sign up for it. It's free to everybody in the community. We also have our Francis Thompson Wilson Critical Issues in Education focused on generative AI on March 7th. Anybody can register for that in the community. If you'd like to come join us in downtown Flint and learn more about what we're doing in this technology and, and learn from uh, experts and other colleagues, we'd love to have you, have you on campus. And where would they find that information? Uh, www.umflint.edu. Okay. Well, Nick Gaspar, Douglas Zyko, U of M Flint, Peter Berry from Saginaw Valley State University. Great discussion. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to learn more and more. It's only going to continue to grow. Yep. And the idea of this show is to educate and inform. And we hope by the end of the show that we get a little bit more information to our viewers and they can do some uh, additional research. So Absolutely. thanks for coming in. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. And Thank that's you. our show for tonight. But be sure to join us again next week for the follow-up. Uh, we're going to talk about Michigan's presidential primary that's happening a lot earlier, as you may know, just in a couple weeks putting a lot more pressure on county clerks. We're also dealing with many changes to our voting laws and to you as well. Hope to see you then. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And make sure to click that bell icon to stay notified when we upload new content. Videos like this are only possible because of viewers like you. To help support this channel, click on the link in the description below. We'll see you next time.